Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next lecture, which is going to be about language contact and code switching. We're going to first talk a little bit about what language contact is and what the outcomes are of language contact and the how code switching works in bilinguals and heritage speakers. Essentially, language contact is whenever speakers of two different language varieties come in contact when, with one another. And I say language varieties because that can mean different languages or different dialects when they come into contact with one another. And um, these types of situations occur frequently uh, in San Diego County. Again, we have lots of different um, speakers of many different languages. They come in contact with one another. What happens in those situations? So some of the contexts uh, in which this happens are due to social forces. So people moving due to war. For example, we have people from Ukraine right now, refugees from Ukraine, um, and also other situations in which um, which cause people to leave their regions and um, go somewhere else. Um, also due to context and colonization um, and trade and urbanization. So there are many different contexts under which speakers of um, different language varieties come in contact with one another. When languages come in contact with one another, so here we're going to focus more on languages rather than different dialects of the same language. Um, there is There are different outcomes depending on the intensity of the contact. So how much contact, how, how, um, how much interaction there is between the speakers of those languages. <clears throat> so, and also how long the interaction lasts. And some of the languages, as you might imagine, they they don't have uh, equal social uh, status, right? And those linguistic forms that result out of the language contact can be perceived differently in terms of correctness and prestige. For example, think about um, if you are a speaker of of Spanish, or even even if you are not a speaker of Spanish in this region, you've probably heard of Spanglish, for example, right? What I'm going to talk about that at the end of this lecture, but for right now, just think about how do you think people perceive what's known as Spanglish, or what do you think people refer to as Spanglish, um, and how that's compared to Spanish or English. So if um, the way that the languages are perceived or the varieties that result from language contact are perceived depends on how the groups of speakers of those languages are perceived. So if both groups are perceived as equally prestigious, we say that those languages are in an ad straddle relationship, like they're at the same level, the same strata. So English and Norse in early England were both in an ad straddle relationship. So really this comes down to what the perception is of the speakers of a particular language variety. It's not about the language itself, but it's how speakers think about others. So if one group is perceived as more prestigious than the other, then the language that they speak is viewed as the super stratum language. And then the less prestigious or the less powerful language is viewed as the substratum language. So if you think about how English was related to the many indigenous Native American languages during the times of the boarding schools when Native American speakers were not allowed to speak their native languages, they those would be considered substratum languages. English was the superstratum language. What are some outcomes of language contact? So when languages come in contact with one another, one natural thing that happens is borrowing. So languages borrow from one another and they borrow usually lexical items or words and sometimes even um, grammatical structures. For example, in because English and Spanish have been in contact with each other for a long time and there's pretty intense contact in, in our county, then we can have words like troca from truck it borrowed from English into Spanish but also we have alligator, which actually comes from the word for lizard in Spanish. So there's borrowings happening both ways. You can think about other words that you know are probably borrowed between English and Spanish and also between uh, any other combination of languages that you might know. 
Another thing that can happen is that languages converge and they share um, features. Uh, this happened, for example, in the Balkan Sprachbund. So Romanian, Bulgarian, Albanian, Greek, Macedonians, Macedonian, they all have similar gender systems. Um, by gender, I mean like nouns being uh, having a particular grammatical form and agreement form, like in Spanish when you have masculine and feminine uh, nouns. And um, uh, whether their articles are in the beginning, like their separate articles or determiners, are they before the noun or after the noun? So some of the grammatical features can converge because of intense contact. Another outcome can be a language shift. So uh, when languages are in contact with one another for a long time and there is a superstratum substratum relationship where one language is perceived as less prestigious and has less power because the people that speak that language are uh, less powerful, then eventually the language shifts to the superstratum language uh, typically. And then the sub substratum language eventually can die out and not be used anymore. And also what another outcome can be the creation of new language forms. So pigeons and creoles are one uh, example of new language forms. When when they come when languages come in contact with one another, and also you can have bilingual mixed languages, or you can even create new dialects. We're not going to spend too much time on this beyond what I just said. If you're curious, you can read more about pigeons and creoles. They're a fascinating topic, and that is one of the outcomes of language contact. I'll just say two things. One, pigeon. Uh, the difference between a pigeon and a creole is that a pigeon is no one's native language. So a pigeon just arises from intense contact, um, from, from contact when people don't speak each other's language and they need a common way to talk to one another. So there's a language that's being formed just for the purposes of basic communication, like in a trade situation. And then if those speakers of those languages stay uh, in contact, remain in contact, so let's say there's a colonization situation, right, then and the speakers just settle there and they mix in and they marry with and they form families with the people that they conquered basically then they use the pigeon to communicate then their children are going to be hearing the pigeon and being exposed to the pigeon as the only way of communicating and the kids end up developing the language more fully and that becomes a creole so a creole is a much more complex language and it is someone's native language, whereas a pigeon is not someone's native language, and it ha it's a very simple, uh, reduced language and used for, like, um, for a smaller range of uh, contexts in daily life. All right, so code switching. This is the the crux of what we want to talk about. Code switching is a natural thing that happens in bilingual, multilingual communities. So. <clears throat> code switching just means switching between two languages or two dialects in the same conversation. So code here is the linguistic form, whether it's a different language or a different dialect, and code switching is using these two or more languages. There are different types of code switching. One type of code switching is in between sentences. That's called intersentential. So you can have one sentence or a longer statement in one language and another statement in another language, or intra, or within a single sentence or utterance. And that's where you have one language, pieces of one language being inserted into the syntactic, so into the sentence structure of another language. And usually the stronger language, the one that the speaker is most proficient in, is the syntactic frame, and that's called the matrix language. And the, um, the, the language that's not as strong is um, inserted into that frame. Sometimes this is also referred to as code mixing, which is in the Park Johnson 2017 reading. So code mixing is um, another word for, another way to refer to intrasentential code switching. And some people just use code switching and code mi mixing kind of interchangeably. An example of this is from Korean heritage speakers, uh, where the speaker, uh, this child, age five, five years, nine months, 
um, code, switch, code, code switching or code mixing in English and Korean, she used the word circle in English and then the verb um, in Korean. And in this case, if you think about it, it says so cir circle pido ayo means I need the circle. The structure of the sentence is Korean and she only used the word circle in English. So her matrix language in this case is Korean and English, the English lexical item circle is inserted into this phrase. So at this stage, um, Korean is her stronger matrix language. So let's talk a little bit about code switching more generally. Adults code switch all the time. I, I code switch with my family in Romanian and English. You can pause this video and just consider when do you code switch? And what we know from research is that adults, when they code switch, that's highly systematic. It means that we don't just do it willy nilly. Not everything goes. You can't just mix everything up from in, in two different languages or two different dialects. There is a system. So some code switches are permissible and some are not. Let's look at some examples. Okay, so if we look at Spanish, these are examples of plausible code switches. One type of code switch that's plausible is before or after tag. Tag questions are um, these examples like in English, when you add, you know that, don't you? So you add a little tag at the end. So you, uh, you saw that, right? So well, you can code switch with a tag. You're almost done with school, verdad? Also, you can code switch between uh, before a predicate adjective, es muy cute. Or you can say, sabes, mi school, mi school bus no tiene un stop sign. You know, my school bus doesn't have a stop sign. So that's an example from language files. So these should be, these should be okay. These should be acceptable code switches. You can check me and let me know if they're not. But I've checked with other students in my classes before and they say that this is correct. Here are some implausible code switches. And whenever you have an asterisk in front of a, sen in front of a sentence in, in, in a linguistics, that means that that's deemed ungrammatical in that particular language variety. So you cannot switch between a clitic and a verb. Don't worry about what a clitic is, but clitic is this other little particle, this little piece um, that refers to a noun. El niño le hit. That should not be possible. Or between a negative and a verb. El jefe no want to pay us. Or between a root and an affix. Estaba ranando in the library. And between a subject pronoun and a verb. Joe went to the store. So these should not be possible. So the thing is, when you have code switches that are possible, and when you have some that are not possible, because speakers would say, mm, I would never say that, that means that there are rules, right? Because if you can say that something is not grammatical, that means that there are rules that you're breaking when you're saying those things. So that is evidence that code switching is rule governed. Whoops. Here's some other examples from Romanian. These are from my sister from a text. So yeah, we code switch a lot in text. And she said, I'm through request pe career center. Mă contactează ei. Okay. Or, cred că ea un con artist on a smaller scale. Tot încerc să wrap my head around what she's like. So that seems very natural when you talk to one another. And you can see that there are little pieces, a stretch in one sentence, in one language, and another stretch in another sentence. And these are both in, so the first one is actually, um, no, both of these are in the, the syntactic frame of Romanian. So Romanian is the matrix language here, and English is the um, the other language. All right. When, when do adults code switch? There are different kinds of situations when adults code switch. So one is just when you make that decision, but there are actually some societies where they have pre-established norms for using multiple languages and that's called diglossia. So one language is used in some contexts and another language is used in other contexts or situations. One example of this is in Paraguay where Guarani and Spanish have specific functions and a diglossia type of situation leads to the maintenance of both languages. So here's a decision tree for how speakers of Guarani and Spanish in um, <clears throat> in Paraguay decide which language they're supposed to use. So first, you have, they have to determine where they are. Are they in a rural context or in a non-rural context? So if it's rural, then they use Guarani. Non-rural, 
then how formal or informal is the situation? If it's formal, you use Spanish. If it's not formal, well, how intimate is the conversation? If it's not intimate, you use Spanish. If it's intimate, then how serious is it? If it's not serious, you use Guarani. If it's serious, well, then it depends on other factors like what was your first language that you learned? What is, um, you know, what is the the gender um, of the of the people speaking? What is the language proficiency of each uh, speaker? How good are they? How comfortable are they in each language? So you can see that this that this is very systematic, and also it, it, there are expectations of what to use in each context, and this supports the maintenance of both languages. When there are no pre-established norms, then it's just something that multilinguals and bilinguals do, and that can be used when there's a topic shift. So for example, um, if I talk about academics, I'm going to mostly talk in English about academics because I've done all of my higher education in the United States in English. Therefore, I just have more vocabulary for uh, academics in English. and I'm just more comfortable with it. So I will use English for that. But if I'm talking to my family about other things, then I'm going to talk to them in Romanian. Affective function. So that's also um, some a factor that plays a role in which language um, bilinguals use. Sometimes there are words that just sound better or they express the, the thought or the concept that you are trying to express better or more accurately the way that you, you think that you want to do that. Also priming. So if somebody starts speaking in one language, then the other person might also continue in that same language. And if it switches, if it switches to the other language, then the other person will switch back too. I see that all the time in my family. Or when we quote someone. So if you want to say exactly what they said, then you will switch to that language. And also to indicate solidarity or distance from someone. So if uh, you want to... In, signal solidarity and identity with a particular group, you might use their more comfortable language. So let's say your parents or grandparents only speak Spanish or only speak Tagalog, then you um, might choose to use Tagalog or Spanish to show that you're closer. And if you are mad at your parents or um, don't want, or you want to put some distance that then you might choose to use, English instead. And that can that can be a reason why adults code switch. And there are other reasons as well. So in monolingual communities, uh, there's also code switching, but there's a, a more, more subtle version. So for example, we we accommodate to the dialect or a particular group of a particular group or a social class. So we do talk differently to different people. For example, travel agents talk differently to different customers. And um, this may be conscious or unconscious or subconscious code switching. Um, teenagers talk differently to grandparents versus their friends, right? So you make that kind of decision. And that's, that's a form of code switching as well. And also, young people frequently adopt non-standard dialects outside of their community, again, to show solidarity, to be part of the group, um, to show connection and identity with the group that they want to be a, be a part of and identify as uh, as they are as they are developing and choosing their social lives. So take three minutes, you can pause this video and really think about and reflect um, on how you code switch and when you code switch. If you're bilingual, when do you code switch and why? If, and if you're monolingual, do you use different dialects? Do you use different styles of speaking? Do you speak differently in different situations? So just think about how this might apply to your life. Now with child code switching, with because that's important for our heritage speakers, especially the simultaneously bilingual ones, but also the sequential bilingual uh, heritage speakers. If you might recall from when we talked about bilingual acquisition, Early code mixing, because children do mix their languages when they acquire two languages at the same time, early code mixing was interpreted as the, the children are confusing their language and therefore they're acquiring one system 
and then differentiating into two later on. And that was the unitary system hypothesis of language acquisition. Okay. And the switches seemed to be not systematic, right? And parents and medical professionals, well-intentioned, used to, and some still do, believe that code mixing is a sign of confusion and encourage parents to stop talking to their children in both languages and just choose the dominant language, which is really detrimental, unfortunately, uh, because later on it becomes just much harder to reintroduce the language. But more recent research supports a differentiated systems approach from early on. And it focuses on the degrees of contact and separation between the two developing languages. So um, <clears throat> it turns out that children uh, code switch for filling in gaps. So remember that there's only so much time that we have in the day. Children cannot learn equally in both of their languages, if they, especially if they are simultaneous bilinguals. But no matter how many, no matter whether the the methodology in which you learn the language, whether it's simultaneous bilingualism or sequential bilingualism, when you're acquiring two languages, you just cannot acquire this at the same rate for both of them. So sometimes a child will insert a word from another language, from their other language into the matrix of another of their other language because they have a gap to fill. And they're also just using everything that they have at their disposal to communicate. So when it comes to code switching and heritage learners, it's important to remember a couple of things. One, they are a highly heterogeneous group. There is great variation in their degrees of proficiency, also in how they acquired the languages. Some are simultaneous bilinguals, others sequential, and uh, different variations of that, like the age of acquisition, for example, and how much input they get in each language. Remember that for a language to be a heritage uh, language or heritage speaker, the language has to be first learned in the home, and then another language is the language of the broader society, right? So not everybody who speaks two languages is, uh, is a heritage um, speaker. There's also this term that's called generation 1.5. So we have first generation speaker, second generation there's this generation 1.5, which refers to children who move to another language speaking country in childhood. So they're kind of in between. And then code switching is different uh, for these groups because again, of the timing of when and how they learn each of their languages. So that we might see different types of code switching among different heritage uh, learners. There are internal factors, so factors that have to do with the children themselves and also external factors that influence when children code switch. So because there's only so much time in the day for acquisition of language in general, if children are acquiring two languages, they're not going to be able to acquire them at equal speeds. So sometimes they will code switch to fill an inter like a lexical gap. You don't you just haven't acquired the particular words in one of your languages. And sometimes you they use code switching to fill in a grammatical gap. So essentially they they use everything at their disposal to be able to communicate fully in both of the, using both of their languages. And uh, this is called like a, a gr grammatical gap filling strategy. And there are external factors. So external factors are, for example, who are they talking with? Who are the interlocutors are? So in my case, since my husband does not speak Romanian, when my daughter was little, she would never speak, she never spoke to my husband in Romanian. She code switched. She used English and Romanian with my parents. She used English and Romanian with me. She never used both languages with my husband. She only used English with my husband. So that also shows that the children are aware of who speaks which language and they choose appropriately, right? And there's more evidence from, uh, I have some references here for where this kind of research has been done and shown this. 
And one example from Genesee 1995 showed that English dominant French speaking children use more French with their French speaking parent and th than with their English speaking parent, which is similar to what I experienced with my daughter, for example. Also, the physical location uh, matters. So when we go to visit my parents, there's more Romanian spoken there than at our house because here we have more English since my husband doesn't speak Romanian. Also, the context, are we talking at the dinner table or are we reading books? Reading happens more in English in, in our home because we just have more English books. But at the dinner table, we might have more uh, Romanian conversations as well. Also, the parents or their interlocutors, whoever they're talking to, are, um, are negotiating actually and influencing the children's language choices by how they react to the switches. So if uh, the parents are encouraging the code switches, the code switches will, ha switches will happen more. If they don't, then it might be more of a monolingual conversation. And the sociolinguistic status of the language can also influence language choice for slightly older children. So for example, um, in my work, I had seen that uh, my daughter realized that she could actually use Romanian as social capital, right? So she could negotiate getting things done or doing more of what she wanted if she used Romanian with me or with my parents, because we were trying to encourage her to do that. So she was able to um, to understand that, okay, in, in our house, if I want to um, accomplish something, I can use Romanian. So this was, for example... Um, like I want my I want my grandparents to visit longer, so I'm going to say something more in Romanian. That then that way they will probably do it uh, are are going to be more likely to do it. So kids become much they become aware of how the socio linguistic status of the language in within their circles can can play a role in their which language they should be using for what purpose. So just some takeaways for heritage language speakers. If they do show code switching, they can use it to fill lexical or grammatical gaps. There can be inter interest intentional switches, so across sentences, and that shows mastery of the matrix language. They can make choices in which language to use, again, for, for the same kinds of purposes that adult speakers use or based on the context, like I said before. And the bilingual status of the interlocutor and the community in general also plays a role in their code switching. The important thing to remember is that code switching is a normal part of bilingual or multilingual development. And it is also a very exciting area to study. Now, let's get back to what I said earlier uh, about Spanglish. So what is Spanglish and what is Chicano English? You may or may not have heard of these terms. So Spanglish is really Spanish English code switching. So it's code switching between Spanish and English. It requires bilingualism. Chicano English is not the same as Spanglish. Chicano English is a dialect of English that developed under the influence of Spanish due to prolonged language contact. And speakers of Chicano English most often don't speak Spanish. So they're monolingual in Chicano English. So Chicano English is a dialect of English. It's not bad English. It's not English used with um, by sp Spanish speakers who are learning English because that doesn't align with the fact that many speakers of Chicano English don't speak Spanish at all. This is their only dialect, their only language. So I'm gonna show you a video from a researcher um, that works on Chicano English, so you can learn a little bit more about it, and then that will conclude this lecture. Spanglish isn't the only Spanish-English hybrid. Carmen Fott is a linguist who's been studying Chicano, one of the street talks of Latino Los Angeles. Chicano English is a dialect of English that grew out of the historical contact between English and Spanish in the Southwest. And you get articles written that say Chicano English is just a step on the way to mastery of English, and that's not true at all. 
Chicano English is now its own vibrant, thriving dialect. It's not going anywhere. Luckily for me, because I do research on Chicano English. Where we had our rest Carmen did much of her research with high school kids with Spanish-speaking parents. She took us to a nearby park to hear some Chicano English. Chris can't throw. Wanting the kids to be as relaxed as possible, we put radio mics on two of them. And then we and the camera are keeping well back. So what's up, dog? It's cracking, dog. What's cracking tomorrow? About the Super Bowl? Yeah. Hey, what's up then? We're going to throw a party. What's up? What girls are you going to have over there? Part. Man, the only thing I know that there's going to be a bunch of primas. What about the, what about the, um, the party you took Mark to? What, Mark Southgate? Ramirez, oh, yeah, in Southgate. That's his family, fool. Nah, are you serious? Yeah, there was a bunch of highness over there, dog. Nah. The highness on the ones that guess like cold head. Mine they were, dog. <laughs> no. In terms of slang items, when he asked him who's going to be at the party, is there going to be any hotness there? Hotness. I mean, uh huh. Meaning, are there going to be any good looking girls there? Uh, I'm tired of talking to you, though. I'm tired of talking <laughs> to you, bro. It's been a while, though. Also, uh, the pitch, the intonation, you'll hear some of the syllables drawn out. What? What you mean, fool? Like that, those sorts of things. Uh, that's also very characteristic of Chicano English. What about these fools? What do you think about these fools? You think they're going to grow to be some real football players or what? Man, that little short foot with uh, cut off sleeves, that's my cousin, dog. He might probably be some. <laughs> the use of fool, uh, for foo, um, for fool, as a term like man or guy, that's very common among kids who speak Chicano English of this age group. In fact, uh, occasionally when I was doing field work and I was interviewing kids who spoke Chicano English, they would actually call me fool, you know, just kind of s slipping it in there the same way we might use man or guy. Or yeah, yeah. Keisha, dog. Keisha. Yeah, Keisha up there in Southgate, dog. She's Mexican with a name like that? Yeah, yeah dog. Seriously, she speaks Spanish too? Nah, she only speak no yeah. Spanish. And they throw in the occasional word in Spanish? Or? Yes, and in fact, What's interesting is that many people believe that Chicano English is a Spanish accent, someone whose first language is Spanish and doesn't speak English well yet. But in fact, as we just heard, we heard Jesse speaking, and he doesn't in fact speak Spanish, only enough to throw in a few words, and those words actually tend to be taboo or swear words. <laughs> and it's still the classic pattern that the first generation born in the United States often will retain the home language. But by the second generation born here, the home language is very often lost. So I don't think Spanish is a threat to English in any way. I think, if anything, it's Spanish that's endangered and we might want to look out for it. Like Carmen, other linguists believe Spanish is no more a threat to English than German or Italian, which once provoked similar fears. Mm.